And the reason we wanted to have John come and share with us, with us his thoughts on uh, technology development is because we see a lot of uh, similarities between what was faced back then with the air quality challenge that we had and what we are now facing with the climate protection program that we have. So we're hoping that uh, John can share some insights and, and some stories in terms of um, pointing us in the right direction as we undertake the uh, protection of a global climate. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce John Mooney. We are webcasting the presentation. For those of you following in the web, uh, I ask you to, let's see, you have the ability to send in comments and questions, and the email is posted. It's auditorium at calipa.ca.gov. Uh, and for those of you in the audience and also for, for John, I remind you to use a microphone so that those following in the webcast can hear uh, the comments and the questions. John? Well, thank you very much, uh, Alberto. That was a very nice introduction. It's a pleasure for me. Oh, right. It's a pleasure for me to uh, be here to tell you the story of the three-way catalyst, uh, its invention, and the barriers we had to negotiate in order to bring it into commercial use. And uh, as Alberto said, try to think of such barriers that you might be facing as you uh, take on an even greater challenge in uh, regulating global warming gases. Um, it's also fitting uh, for me to be here in California to talk about the story because the first time it was publicly disclosed was in uh, a hearing that California had uh, with respect to what was known as sulfuric acid mist being produced by the first catalyst, oxidation catalyst. Uh, back in the early days in 1975, the first um, catalysts that were on cars were oxidation catalysts. And it was found they were producing, they were removing hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, but there was a certain, the sulfur in the fuel was being oxidized to sulfur trioxide and in the exhaust uh, combined with uh, water to form a, a sulfuric acid mist. It was, it was a mild mist, but it was a controversy. And I came out, uh, we already had invented the three-way catalytic converter. It was only a year, year old. It was in, not in commercial use yet. We were still developing it. But I thought it would be not producing sulfuric acid mist. And presented that at the hearing. Mary Nichols, the current chairman, was there. So was uh, Professor Sawyer. And Tom Quinn was the chairman. Uh, so it, I feel... I feel I'm back at home talking uh, about th this technology. <clears throat> the vehicle exhaust emissions regulations really provided the basis for the invention. The Clean Air Act amendments of, of 1970 required 90% reduction of hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, and NOx. We had an oxidation catalyst at that time and we knew that the first two could be oxidized, hydrocarbon and CO. But we did not know <clears throat> what kind of technology. There didn't exist technology that could do 90% reduction of, uh, of NOx. So how to control NOx? It required oxidation of hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide and reduction of NOx, removing the oxygen from, from NOx to create nitrogen. Uh, a dual bud catalytic converter uh, was, uh, <coughs> was thought to be uh, the leading technology, and uh, it required the engine be <coughs> calibrated for a, a rich air flow ratio uh, with, with little oxygen present. Uh, high, high amounts of CO and hydrocarbons so that NO could be reduced in a reduction reaction. Then an air pump would provide uh, air to be injected between the uh, NOx reduction catalyst and the oxidation catalyst, and uh, that air mixed with the exhaust would uh, cause catalytic reactions to, re to oxidize hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. So car makers and catalyst companies were working on this, this second generation system. In, this, in the course of the laboratory uh, uh, 
work on oxidation catalysts. Uh, one of our researchers, uh, Bob Kenson, uh, uh, found by adjusting uh, <coughs> synthetic uh, mixtures in the lab laboratory uh, precisely uh, uh, at different points. When it came to stoichiometric, he found that there was high oxidation and reduction occurring right at this little point at the stoichiometric line. Palladium was better than platinum. Chemical calculations were done. Uh, thermodynamics were favorable. We, uh, we had been working with Ford Science Laboratory for a couple of years, and um, uh, they had equipped a, uh, a car with a carburetor that, that was calibrated with a, a rich idle and a, a lean um, uh, main jet. When that was operated over a cycle, they got some hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide oxidation and NO reduction. So <clears throat> this was another step along the way. And most importantly, uh, four uh, Ford engineers in the 1970 clean air car race uh, represented uh, Wayne University and used this concept. And uh, they won the overall uh, clean air car race where 30, 43 universities were, were competing. They run the overall rating uh, with our platinum ca uh, PTX catalyst. It, it, however, was unique. It was perfectly calibrated by hand. But there was no practical system, uh, no concept to control air and fuel for the stoichiometric mixture because of the variables that are always present, uh, air quality uh, changing uh, because of temperature, barometric pressure, humidity, altitude. Fuel quality being of different stoichiometric values because of winter and summer grade fuels. Uh, pr production, oil refinery production uh, uh, composition variables and, uh, and presence or lack of ox oxygenates. And of course, the engine would wear. There was durability of the engine. There was the dynamics of, of uh, acceleration and deceleration. Uh, there, there was compression ratio differences. Uh, 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 turbocharger uh, provided, you know, a high, higher and lower uh, compression ratio depending on uh, uh, the mo its mode. And of course, the air filter would uh, the inlet air filter would clog and change the amount of air coming into the engine and change the geometry. So there was no open loop system simply could not work. So uh, in, my, in present, I was assigned the, the job of going around talking about oxidation catalysts to every car company in the world. And I always brought to their attention uh, this, this uh, data that had been provided by, uh, by uh, our laboratory and said that if a stoichiometric fuel mixture could be man maintained, and Englehart would like to cooperate uh, to develop a catalyst for it. And uh, Volvo responded in 1974, sent us a engine that had been equipped with an oxygen sensor by Robert Bosch and a Bosch, Bosch uh, KG Chronic uh, fuel injection system. And, <coughs> uh, uh, and we, we, we uh, were, uh, had, had really formed at that point the Volvo Bosch Engelhard team to fully develop the system to be a very clean uh, 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 total emission control system with potential to meet the statutory standards of the Clean Air Act. Now, <coughs> that's the background. Here's how it works. There's the through rate catalytic converter. I think almost everybody here uh, knows about the catalytic converter. The central point is uh, a uh, catalytic unit that's housed in a can that provides a lot of geometric surface area uh, upon which we put a layer of uh, a catalyst on every channel throughout the whole ca uh, catalytic unit. And um, <coughs> uh, it's, it's of high cell density uh, so that uh, the total total area of contained in within a liter and a half of catalyst might be the size of two football, two football fields. 
in, in, in area. Um, the basic components of a three-way uh, closed-loop uh, field metering system are shown here. I don't have a pointer, so uh, you'll have to figure out here what I'm talking about. The first on the right uh, is a hot wire. Uh, oop. Hmm? Oh, oh. Oh, I see. The uh, fir first uh, point in the system, this is new. This is a way to measure uh, the amount of air flowing into the engine. Uh, uh, that signal uh, went to an electronic control unit. That was a computer. The first time a computer appeared on a, a automobile, it computed the amount of fuel that would be injected by a, a fuel inject by the series of fuel injectors uh, on top of each inlet valve um, before it opened. Combustion would take place. The uh, exhaust gas would go out the exhaust valve and pass an oxygen sensor. The oxygen sensor would detect any deviation from the calibrated amount, any deviation from stoichiometric or the control point from the calibrated amount, and tell it, tell it whether it was slightly rich or slightly lean, and then provide a correction back to the electronic uh, control unit, who would then t uh, slightly change the amount of fuel uh, injected in the next sequence. And uh, following, uh, following that, of course, was a three-way catalytic converter. And at stoichiometric uh, conditions, we were, going to, we were getting hydrocarbon and CO oxidation and NOx reduction. This, this was an enormous uh, change for the auto industry. They had used carburetors for so long. And now this was fuel injection. The, the calibration, the tolerances, were an order of magnitude more than they were with a carburetor. Uh, now, uh, just look on the, on the, at the graph on the right. The, 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 the schematic on the left is of the, the same thing I described uh, uh, on the previous slide. But the oxygen sensor puts out a uh, millivolt signal that measures when it's rich about uh, 750 to 900 millivolts, and when it is lean up stoichiometric, uh, down around 150 uh, to uh, 50 milli, uh, millivolts. The control point at stoichiometric was around 500 millivolts, and any reading that was higher would say that you had too much, uh, too little air, any reading that was lower, there was too much air. So, um, <coughs> and this closed, loop fuel metering system maintains the air and fuel to an average stoichiometric mixture. Now, when we finally, uh, at first it looked like it was a switch, on and off switch, and when we finally got uh, an answer to what the, react, the uh, response time of the oxygen sensor was to a change, we found that, in fact, um, when let's say let's say when when uh, the point th this is a this is a graph uh, that, that runs between here and here at one second, so it was a timed graph measuring millivolt output of the oxygen sensor, and when it was uh, lean, uh, the uh, oxygen sensor was telling the electronic control unit that you're too lean, go rich, and it would go rich. Oops. Too, and too rich. And then lean, go lean, then rich. Go rich, go lean, back and forth it would go. And it was not staying at stoichiometric at all. Rather, it was fluctuating a, a huge amount. Be, uh, one time uh, 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 with little oxygen present and another time with too much. So it not, was not at stoichiometric conditions very long. Now, uh, uh, I come back to that little section of the something I sli uh, slide I said, showed earlier. Uh, within the catalytic layer, 
that is applied on to the substrate that has all the geometric surface area. There are many particles of alumina and, and other support materials. Upon that uh, uh, grain of uh, alumina, we have dispersed precious metals. And each little, looks like measles here, each little dot is a very, very small nanoparticle size, nanometer particle size precious piece of precious metal. It could be platinum or rhodium or palladium. The reactions we were expecting are oxidation of carbon monoxide, oxidation of uh, hydrocarbons, and reduction with uh, NO. And I showed CO as the reductant here. The actual three uh, catalyst mechanism, had, mechanism has been identified as following. Um, oh, I wanted to point out something that uh, as hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, and NOx gases pass into the channel, they, they diffuse by a, <clears throat> by a concentration gradient uh, between the bulk gas and the surface. Um, uh, according to uh, concentration difference. That's the driving force. It's just like uh, hot uh, gas flowing to a cold surface. And there's plenty of time for all those molecules to, to diffuse to the catalytic surface uh, and get uh, bound onto uh, each catalyst site. And the sequence uh, for uh, reduction is that uh, we have a very small rhodium crystallite, a few nanometers in diameter. Carbon monoxide and uh, oxi uh, nitric oxide would uh, 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 diffuse to the s surrounding area of the rhodium uh, crystal. There would be bond, uh, nox, nox molecule bond stretching. Uh, and um, <coughs> uh, nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms would uh, share electrons with uh, electron bond with the rhodium surface. The uh, nitrogen molecules would get together and, re and react and have sufficient energy to desorb. Uh, and the oxygen atoms would remain. And we're, we would be stuck here if we didn't have something else around to remove those oxygen uh, uh, atoms. And carbon monoxide has uh, been identified as the um, reductant that is primarily um, picking up uh, the oxygen, freeing it from the, from the surface and returning the uh, rhodium uh, uh, catalyst site to uh, start the whole cycle all over again. And this, this cycle goes on and on and on for the life of the, the, the car, uh, the catalytic converter on the car. So carbon monoxide is both friend and foe. I mean, here it's a, it's a friend. It is, uh, removes uh, the oxygen that is stuck on the rhodium surface so the reduction, reduction can continue. And... Uh, a platinum surface that provides a meeting, meeting place for the ox, oxidation reactions. Here again, we have oxygen and CO. They have diffused, diffused from the bulk gas to the area within the catalytic layer where a catalyst site, platinum catalyst site exists. Oxygen uh, is attracted to the surface. There's electron bond stretch. stretch. It shares its atoms uh, with, with, uh, with uh, platinum by electron bond. And CO is also chemisorbed on to the surface and uh, then uh, reacts with the uh, oxygen and uh, in the fifth step um, uh, CO2. CO2 is formed and is desorbed from the surface, returning it to the clean surface for this cycle to occur. <coughs> now, um, because of this fluctuating condition, that, that uh, this, this particular chart is what provided Carl Keith and I with the idea that we had to pick up oxygen when it was in 
uh, short supply and uh, pick up oxygen when it was in uh, excess supply and, uh, and somehow get rid of it uh, when it was uh, in short supply. And um, we looked to uh, uh, materials that had different kinds of oxidation states. And we found, uh, among others, there was nickel and iron and uh, several base metals. But one of the best was uh, uh, cerium oxide that had two different distinct um, uh, oxidation states. In the lean, when there was too much oxygen, the cerium plus three uh, uh, oxide would pick up a half um, uh, an atom of uh, oxygen and uh, um, become cerium O, cerium O2, two, two molecules of cerium O2. And this was a reducible oxide where, where in the rich conditions it would be reduced by CO back to the cerium plus three uh, form. So uh, this captures uh, this cerium uh, CE203 uh, form, captures excess oxygen that would be escaping the tailpipe otherwise and saves it for CO oxidation when it's in short supply. So it, in, in, in fact, was modifying the swings within the catalytic layer. Uh, it, they didn't disappear uh, such that uh, we, we got very high performance uh, of, of uh, these reactions. And uh, the final uh, uh, improvement uh, came from uh, layering catalysts. Originally, we just put everything in one single layer. There are, there are oxidants and, and reductants, and they diffuse from the bulk gas into the catalytic layer. They encounter palladium sites and rhodium sites. And the two reactions that we were anticipating are competitive. And if a um, oxygen consumes a reductant in an oxidation reaction, such as the first equation shows, then there is less available for NOx reduction. So uh, less reductant available for NOx reduction. So one of the uh, ways around that was to uh, double layer catalyst and place, for instance, palladium in the upper layer and platinum in the lower layer. And when we did this, uh, we uh, improved uh, NOx reduction by 15%. So it would, this was an important also finding. I want to add that um, I, I forgot to point out. When we put an oxygen sensor on uh, the outlet of the catalyst, it, the, the control point was 500 millivolts, and it maintained 500 millivolt uh, signal, indicating that we were maintaining stoichiometric conditions. Oh, sorry. Now, here's certification re results. This happened in California. In, uh, April, on April 27th, 1976, just two years probably after we had uh, understood uh, exactly what was needed for uh, three-way catalysts to perform in the laboratories, Volvo qualified their uh, uh, four models, uh, 3,000 uh, weight class and a manual five-speed transmission and also an automatic, and then a 3,500 pound vehicle, which I believe was a station wagon, and also with two versions of transmission. And this note that this was astonishing. Uh, California had a standard at that time in 1977, 0 0.419 and 1.5 respectively hydrocarbon CO and NOx in terms of grams per mile. And the, the uh, the um, results showed all way below that number uh, for also for carbon monoxide. And um, for NOx, it was almost 90% below. It was really astonishing. And um, later regulations, for instance, it, it, it would meet later US Tier 1 regulations. But this is in 1994. This is the regulation here in 1976. This, this catalyst in this system was, was very efficient. More, more was to be achieved as time went on. 
And one latter point is that uh, we had carburetors in play at that time, and we were working on a closed-loop carburetor. So all of the work I showed up to now was a uh, fuel injection system. But there was also a single-point fuel injection that it was so developed and General Motors used. And then there's the multi-point fuel injection system uh, where, where uh, there was a fuel injector right at every cylinder. Now, in evaluating these uh, versions, um, th this, this is three evaluation curves for uh, removal efficiency versus air fuel ratio for the closed loop system where it had multi-point fuel injection, the middle one for a single point fuel injection, and the last one on the, on the right um, was, um, was a simulated co closed loop carburetor. It was all the same catalyst. And you can see that uh, the uh, right stoichiometric uh, uh, hydrocarbon, excuse me, uh, uh, NOx and uh, CO crossover was about 75%. The single point was about 85%, and multi point was uh, over 90%. This, this information told us also that there was a great development path for fuel metering and emission controls. Now, not just the catalyst. So it was a, a unique success story. Um, it minimized the environmental uh, impacts of the automobile. Literally all uh, cars in the world now uh, have, if they have unleaded gasoline, uh, even if they're secondhand cars, have three-way catalyst. And um, uh, the three-way system was integrated into, the catalyst was integrated into the engine system. Other forms of emission controls would be not the ones liking. Healthier lives for billions of people. Uh, every time I do this uh, estimate of how many billion tons were, uh, I come up with a different number, but it's about that, maybe twice as high, not, or 50% higher. Um, and it's directly, the three-way catalyst is directly associated with the elimination of atmospheric lead throughout the world. In the United States, that complement also goes to the oxidation catalyst converter. But, you know, in Europe and the rest of the world, it's mostly through a catalyst converter. When it comes in, it requires unleaded fuel. And the negative effects uh, that affect uh, children's health, now I've lost the thing, children's uh, uh, mental health development are, are avoided. They lose up to 10 IQ points if li living close to a, a highway where leaded fuel is used. Uh, it causes high blood pressure and heart disease and organ damage in adults and is a per pervasive uh, atmospheric pollutant. So to its credit also goes the fact that uh, it had to be used. L unleaded gasoline had to be used for this to be a viable technology. I'll skip over this except for this latter, latter point, uh, the last bullet here. It also passed uh, secondary emission scrutiny. It didn't make any sulfuric acid mist, as I indicated, nor NO2. No oxida oxidation catalyst oxidized NO in the exhaust that was present in the exhaust NO2, if it had platinum uh, present in its formulation. And uh, nor does it make any N2O, uh, only briefly with palladium catalysts uh, at startup. It d doesn't also make metal carbonyls like nickel carbonyl or iron carbonyl. Uh, whereas in comparison, the oxidation catalyst uh, did form a uh, fair, fairly large amount of sulfuric acid mist. Um, Okay, there's continued. I, I won't. Uh, uh, you can take a look at uh, some of uh, uh, some of these, but I would say one point to make is that California actually uh, in, uh, extracted from this technology all that it could give. I, I even think there's some some more that can be achieved, but I mean they went introduced the LEV standards, LEV one, two, three, ULEV, SULEV. Piece of standards, all of which were driving uh, the the uh, three criteria criteria pollutants lower and lower. 
And European standards also uh, rely very heavily on uh, a uh, ver very well-functioning uh, uh, three-way catalyst. More country countries take advantage of the fully developed loadboarding uh, vehicles by adopting emission standards and unleaded gasoline. Uh, they're, they're also becoming more durable. Um, they, the, um, the thermal resistance uh, has improved from initially around three, uh, 1,000 degrees centigrade. It could be exposed to 1,000 degrees centigrade without much decline in its performance. And now, in stepwise, it's already up to 1,150 degrees centigrade. It was only 50 degrees centigrade centigrade lower than the softening point of the ceramic substrate. By that time, metals would also be uh, white hot and very uh, more, uh, weak. Okay. Um, the key issues were the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1970. They were technology forcing. I don't know where we would, when the three-way catalyst uh, would have been invented, if, it, if at all, without the fact that this was 90% reduction of hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, and NOx, and no real uh, understanding that it had been done for NOx. The Clean Air Car Race was also very important because the university teams uh, met, met the Nixon standard and then be provided an example to Congress who had the Clean Air Act amendments under consideration right at the time that the uh, five, five or six winning cars were displayed on the Capitol steps and the Congress came out and saw that children, not children, students, college university students uh, could do it. And therefore, so could Detroit. So it, it, they were a trend, tremendous ally. And of course, unlike gasoline, the fact that uh, this was mandated was very, very important. The negative issues at that time were uh, the oil industry, uh, uh, the EPA, wanted, in some of its first uh, acts, wanted to get parity on the unleaded fuel and leaded fuel at the pump so that there wouldn't be any incentive to misfuel. And uh, the oil industry scuttled that uh, and pump, uh, unleaded pump price soared to, uh, you know, 14 percent. It was only 50, 50 cent fuel back at that time, uh, soared uh, uh, to 14 cents above uh, leaded above uh, the unloaded pump price uh, soared to 15% uh, above lead. Uh, e EPA then uh, uh, in 1973 grant, uh, granted interim standards and provided uh, uh, not a level pl playing field anymore. And the EPA scuttled automakers attempt to uh, use a 1974 as a trial of the catalytic converter and unleaded gasoline. And they required uh, the use of leaded gasoline test fuel for the certification. Um, that, that uh, the, the, the conclusions I draw here are that uh, the initially cooperative auto industry lost focus. They regained it later. They had a, they had a good focus and they lost it. Uh, EPA uh, accommodation was lacking. Uh, in 1975, this was oxidation catalyst. In 1975, GM adopted the catalytic converter, even though it wasn't needed. Needed. They retuned the engine, gaining 20% to 28% fuel economy, and a huge gain, gain in engine performance. The others had to follow. Ford used a. They had a V8 engine. They used the converter first on one side and not on the other, and then they couldn't do this retuning. But in the mid-year, 1975 and a half, they adopted the GM approach. Chrysler uh, tried to use lean burn adjustment, and they had disastrous sales re results. So Ed Cole, the General Motors president, was a great engineer. He did the right thing. He made that decision to use the catalytic converter himself, and it's forever to his credit. Uh, <clears throat> the interim standards were also an auto industry mistake. For the reason, the second bullet, Japanese car makers had four small vehicles, thus better fuel economy. They did not lead the catalytic uh, converter to reach the interim standards and uh, used a low pump price, leaded gasoline. And they 
their sales improved uh, because of that, and there was a great penetration advantage uh, during fuel shortages for J Japanese car makers. The three-way catalyst penetrated uh, slowly uh, and then uh, uniformly when the U.S. 1983 standards were, were uh, mandated. And uh, the three-way catalyst was integrated into the system and not considered a hang-on device. I make this point because we're trying to clean up diesel engines and the, and the emission controls that are in the exhaust are called after treatment, you know, not part of the engine. And this is wrong, I also believe, I think, the fact that the three-way catalyst was integrated and thought of engineers as being a benefit uh, was, was a, a key to its success. Now, barriers overcome and changes required. And uh, as I go through these, uh, think of uh, uh, relevance to global warming planning now being faced by California and the nation. First, uh, in 1973, we had an invention of the three of our little PTX converter, platinum converter. It became it was an outcome of the first work that was done for California uh, in the first half of uh, the 1960s. We found that lead poisoned the catalyst, therefore it needed unleaded fuel. Engelhard was a supplier uh, to the oil industry, and uh, we supplied them with catalyst reforming catalysts, ca uh, catalytic reforming catalysts, also with many catalysts for petroleum and petroleum chemicals. And um, uh, we knew they didn't want to hear about throwing lead out. Uh, so should we put our invention on the shelf? We decided no. We tried to select a proof market. We did so in 1965. Forklift trucks and mining equipment were our target. Uh, LPG was often used on forklift trucks that operated in warehouses and carbon monoxide uh, uh, accumulated within the uh, enclosed spaces. So there, there was a small market, and we used it as a proof market. And while we did that, we kept, the eye on, kept our eye on a big one. Um, Ford evaluated the PTX uh, and got good emission results in laboratory and customer uh, fleets, it, and they knew of its advantages. When uh, then in 1969, Ford, Ford decided to approach Congress, and did and did so. In, and this occurred in the fall of uh, 1969, and this was reflecting a public and news media outcry for Detroit action to clean up the uh, uh, pollution that was being caused by automobiles. But General Motors President Ed Cole became the industry spokesman. He was an outstanding engineer. He had been chief engineer of Chevrolet before uh, uh, climbing up to become General Motors President. He asked for unleaded gasoline and strict auto emission standards. And then and just two, two and a half months later, President Nixon uh, sat <coughs> or recommended 1975 hydrocarbon and CO standards and 1980 hydrocarbon CO and NOx standards. But there, uh, then during that period of time, the, the spring, the summer, the fall of 1970, the U.S. Congress considered the Clean Air Act amendments, uh, Clean, Air, Clean Air Act amendments of 1970. There was plenty of counter political force. The oil industry, that the rest of the lead industry, published a full page Wall Street Journal, back page the Wall Street Journal saying this is a $20 billion mistake. And uh, <coughs> uh, there were also Wall Street editorials, I think, over the years, maybe eight of them. The last one I remember the title. Oh, oh, here comes the catalyst, and it was a collage of all of the um, uh, previous editorials. And so uh, that registered. That was quite a 
forceful uh, counter counter uh, weight against uh, the, uh, the Clean Air Act amendments being very strict. Uh, NAPCA, uh, National Pollution Air Pollution Control Administration, which w was a predecessor to EPA at a lower level, uh, conceived the Clean Air Act. To the Clean Air Car Race of 1970. Forty-three universities uh, participated in uh, uh, <coughs> a race that started in MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, had a stop at the US EPA Ann Arbor National, New National Laboratories, and then uh, had a final uh, test run at Caltech uh, in California. Uh, unloaded gasoline, LPG, natural gas, diesel fuel, spark ignited engines, gas turbine engines, uh, hi two hybrid engines, um, and uh, diesel, one diesel engine by uh, Roberta Nichols, who uh, was from California, later worked for Ford. All met the Nixon 1975 emissions, and uh, as I explained earlier, uh, the class winners uh, influenced, I believe, the Congress in uh, the, the Clean Air in uh, in going for uh, very strict Clean Air Act amendments of 1970. And doing so, a market was created. But then there was a petition for suspension. Engelhardt took a very strong position uh, that the catalytic converter was a credible candidate, and we paid for that uh, by not getting some of the business. Uh, I won't go into that detail, but it is uh, tough to stick your, stick your neck out sometimes. Um, <coughs> EPA granted interim standards. I already said that was a mistake. After the hearings, I already talked about uh, General Motors uh, adopting a catalytic converter and that the Japanese car makers uh, didn't need to, need to use it. Um, now, the national, this, this often occurs, the National Academy of Sciences was consulted. And the question was, is the catalytic converter technology uh, viable? They were not unanimously in favor. Uh, they met, some thought that it could be done within the engine Uh, both through combustion, Professor Glassman from Princeton thought that, and or through engine modification, and Professor Haywood, I believe it was, who from MIT also uh, felt that way, that it, it could be done within the engine. So many thought it was too fragile. There were uh, Dr. Wise from Northwest and uh, Professor Hightower from Rice University who were chemical engineers and understood catalysts who felt it was was good. So, uh, but many many others thought it was an interim solution, and uh, this was a tough hurdle for us to get over. Even though internally we we, we knew we had something, um, the public had a dim view. Uh, from 1970 to 1974, there were. Uh, already some standards uh, on automobiles, and they uh, really caused poor vehicle performance. Uh, there was some EGR, a certain amount of EGR that was put in, and that was a very bad experience. Uh, you shut off the engine, and the engine kept running. You turned the key off, and the engine kept running. It was dieseling, and uh, also creating uh, uh, even more serious pollution. Fuel economy was often less than 10 miles per gallon, and uh, the public therefore uh, viewed the catalytic converter as more of the same. So there, there was uh, some uh, demonstrations that uh, 1975 model air improved fuel economy and performance, but that memory uh, didn't, didn't uh, uh, reverse the entire public's dim view. And we also almost lost the leaded gasoline war in the early Reagan years. 
there were internal companies within our company. Uh, many thought it was a three-year project. Yeah, we could make some money on in the three, those three years. But uh, where, where does the future lie? It was a heavy investment. There were other projects to work on. And this, this delay, they would say, was impeding our future growth. And General Motors at that time had 53% of the market. They had 40 catalytic. We had a contract with uh, Ford Motor Company as being their uh, preferred uh, technical supplier and partner. But uh, with General Motors, we were one of 40 companies, candidate companies. After a while, uh, they cut it down to 10, and we were number 10. They cut it down to seven, we were number seven. They cut it down to four, we were number four. We were hanging in there, but never number one until the end. Uh, so uh, this, cut, this kind of rating uh, wasn't sitting well with every, every, every part of our company. There were tech many technical hurdles. I won't go into detail, but I mean, there was in-use driving scenarios that were so different. There, were, there was very light uh, driving uh, by many people, challenging, aggressive driving by uh, others, uh, people with many, you know, very loaded conditions for, for a passenger car, uh, 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 pulling a very heavy trailer. And uh, there was this question uh, called uh, overheating of the catalytic converter and causing potential for causing fires. And in California, thank goodness to the, uh, it wasn't his intended outcome, but the, the head of the California Division of Motor Vehicles called the national, not the national press, to a demonstration where he had a catalytic car and a identical non-equipped uh, uh, car pull over an oat, uh, a pile of oats that were, had very low kindling temperature, drugged up both cars, pulled them over, uh, Time Magazine and Newsweek were present, and uh, the non-catalytic converter uh, car started a fire. So he pulled them all back, put out the fire, put more oats down, revved them up a little more, put them over both, and both cars started a fire. So it, it uh, in national, <laughs> before the national press, it settled somewhat, but the National, the Department of Transportation kept a track of car fires uh, for, for many years and finally announced that they were stopping it because there was no indication that, uh, that uh, one or the other would be more susceptible to fire, and certainly not the catalytic converter. <coughs> There's re, uh, reliability issues um, concerning uh, engine misfire, however. Uh, ignition wiring uh, had to be uh, waterproof and thermally resistant, uh, uh, and um, um, <coughs> one, one uh, this last point on the bottom, fuel saturation. Everyone was thinking that if we ever soaked it with gasoline, with oil on the surface, we would certainly cause a, uh, that fire. But when you started some of them off uh, with a catalytic converter soaked with gasoline, it just boiled it off for a, a, a period of time until it was all gone, and then it would start working as a catalyst. It was, it was not a uh, failure mode. And then we had products. Uh, Ford and European car makers uh, wanted the PTX monolithic converter. General Motors wanted the pelletic catalyst. Therefore, we had to have two sample shops, two catalyst development programs, and leading to two plants. Um, I, I'll, I'll skip this one, uh, I think I can. But when we came to the three-way catalyst, we had a, a oxidation catalyst uh, manufacturing investment. We, after only two years, we wanted to change it to the three-way catalyst. Uh, we were asking for more money from, from the company to do that. And uh, it replaced the initial process. Um, the three-way catalyst, I, as I showed you earlier, it, it really provided, provided efficiency that was greater than what was needed. So, so we, ha we had to get into the, uh, not further development, but to take some of the cost out. 
Japanese and U.S. industry, only wanted the carburetor fuel metering. He had to work with all the carburetor companies in the world, uh, Carter, Holly in the United States, Rochester, uh, and Weber, <coughs> Solex uh, in Europe, uh, Deutsche Vergasser, Gesellschaft, and Japanese uh, Bakuni and others. Uh, and um, this kind of had a diversion, but eventually the whole industry came to the fuel injection system. It threatened the established companies. I mean, uh, threatened and eventually displaced the established uh, automotive uh, carburetor industry. So there was a huge change. And, and this is, a, this is a very relevant to what's facing you with CO2. There will be current industries that will be affected and may lose half of their business or make a lot of business and others will uh, grow. So change occurs and you have to keep up with it. But this, uh, this uh, replacement overcame uh, uh, traditional limitations. Uh, you, you saw the older cars, they had a fender here and a hood came up. It was because the carburetor sat, uh, sat on the top and uh, there was a vertical height you couldn't get around. And when, when fuel injection came in, that limitation allowed streamlining the hood and slippery, uh, you know, uh, improvement in, uh, in fuel efficiency by not push, having to push air around. The inlet manifold was uh, a wash with gasoline, so you were on a hill, it would go down and the one cylinder would be very rich or uh, lean um, at, at certain times uh, because of uh, the way the carburetor uh, worked. Fuel flow momentum <coughs> and inertia during transients were a problem. When, uh, when you were at full, full speed and caused a throttle, the fuel was in motion, it continued. The, the, the reverse happened when you wanted to start. There was always a delay, a step, because uh, the air flowed, but the fuel <coughs> uh, took time to uh, proportion itself to the amount of airflow. And electric, uh, electronic ignition displaced traditional ignition distributor. Uh, that was provided reliable ignition, overcame came wet electrical shorts, contact wear, durability, calibration, high voltage limitations, which were good for improved combustion, and sawtooth fuel efficiency. And then we had to con supply the industry, convince the industry of precious metal supply. You know, it came from South Africa and Russia. Very little from Canada and America. Uh, proven reserves was a question. Was there sufficient processing? What about the supply chain, the security of it? High-priced high, high uh, precious metals. And same, same with other raw materials uh, that there always had to be two sources. Uh, organization, organization and management. You know, we were not a supplier to the auto industry. There was too much to do and too little time. Um, the company was not a automotive supplier, as I said. But, so we used consultants skilled in these areas. I mean, we hired, uh, when we looked for a plant location, we hired somebody who was skilled in that area, consultant. Same with the business plan, the organization, the management system, the process. And we, for the first time, took, in, uh, took on statistical process control uh, as a w instead of quality control. It was the correct way to do this kind of a product and most efficient. Uh, but we needed, uh, we, we got the equivalent of Deming. Deming was a statistician that helped the Japanese. This, this guy, Len Cedar, was, uh, he was his equivalent in the United States. Uh, <coughs> employee search, uh, supplier certification, also having SPC, that was very important. Uh, I'll skip this one, and uh, it was difficult to get uh, the European uh, countries to embrace uh, the three-way catalyst initially. Uh, only certain companies, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, Austria, uh, embraced it. The, U the uh, UK uh, considered it a US mistake. They, they preferred uh, lean burn and leaded gasoline. They were really divided on leaded, on leaded, and that continued 
even until after 2000, the year 2000, some companies still, some countries still had levy gasoline in Europe. But the UK Parliament, two parliament, uh, members of Parliament uh, went on the floor and talked about uh, the, the U.S. mistake of three-way catalyst and unleaded gasoline. And uh, uh, next day came out a report uh, about uh, children <coughs> that had been examined along uh, motorways of the U.K. and found they had lost, uh, compared to their uh, cohort, uh, uh, children in other neighborhoods, uh, uh, six or seven uh, IQ points in their development because of lead. And these guys were very repentant and, uh, um, and, and completely switched and changed the whole uh, approach in the uh, UK. <coughs> and then uh, the, U the EU the uh, European Union was organized and European standards and timetable took place. Now, uh, I'll skip this one and this one. I want to talk uh, just a bit about uh, the fact that the three-way catalytic converter provided direction for other related uh, uh, initiatives. Tough standards provided room and incentive for invention. Uh, or when a company looked at uh, projects uh, uh, to, to meet those standards, uh, they, they could uh, look at the risk and the investment and potential return and uh, <coughs> provided this forward thinking uh, to the future. And uh, it was a market-based approach. Now, this averaging banking and trading uh, that has been thrust on us on every, seem, seems that every regulation coming out of uh, Washington, sometimes here in California, have averaging banking and trading. But um, if you think about using that as an incentive to uh, leverage uh, uh, cooperation and get global warming issues to uh, come to uh, quickly to uh, a significant change. I think that should not be automatically put in to any regulation. A justification must be needed for it uh, rather than a wishy uh, mar uh, term surrounding, uh, surrounding market-based uh, apple pie, mother and apple pie, uh, I don't know, arguments. Uh, so I, it didn't exist for us. And certainly uh, our uh, development was market-based. It was the true market-based uh, uh, <coughs> clear business case. <coughs> uh, I, would, I would suggest you start with a clean sheet of paper. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, negotiated rulemaking with all stakeholders is uh, what is needed. You need all the technology, you need all the inputs, but uh, you're charged with uh, providing something that's uh, going to be beneficial quickly. So uh, inevitably, uh, the regulated industry takes over no matter what, it seems. And uh, but. Uh, I would also advise that public interest, interest to be strongly and proportionally represented, and, and that already exists here in California. Now, last thing is opportunities. From, there are four opportunities, I think, come from the freeway catalyst as related to uh, uh, experience, as related to what's facing you in global warming uh, and uh, gases and fuel consumption. The first is electronically cold controlled engine. That, that provides an opportunity, uh, we, uh, I believe, to use a systems approach. I'll explain that. A flexible fuel engine capability uh, uh, throughout the nation uh, would provide a national advantage for any change that might, might occur where fuel, fuels uh, that currently exist wouldn't be 
in existence anymore. We can utilize the exhaust energy that's already, thermal energy that's already in the exhaust to produce onboard electrical power. I'll talk about that. And then this thing about metrics. Uh, uh, you, you got to think about how uh, the metrics are to be formed. And uh, for an example, that would, a correct met metric would really influence uh, the establishment of a clean diesel engine that could be uh, put on uh, <coughs> uh, California roads without polluting and with uh, uh, providing a uh, improvement in, in uh, <coughs> fuel and in fuel and lower CO2, hopefully. So this, these last four things. Um, yikes. Um, I thought I would be done by now. I just got four of them. The electronically controlled engine system approach. Um, ma maximum power on an engine is, is achieved uh, rich between uh, uh, about 13 and a half air fuel ratio. So this is rich. Stoichiometric achieve, uh, condition achieves the best uh, uh, emission controls. And lane adjustment uh, achieves the best fuel economy all by itself. So there's a triangle and um, uh, engine calibrations with an electronic engine can adjust for one, any one of those or, all together, or optimize all together. And um, <coughs> that, that's been utilized by engine calibrators. And engine improvements of various types provide uh, further optimization uh, opportunity. But somehow, fuel economy improvements in, in recent time became untouchable by ban of CAFE changes each year over the more than 10 year period in the federal budget. There was a line item uh, restricting the National Highway, State, Highway and Safety Administration from improving CAFE. Somebody's got to be held responsible for that because there's this, I believe, a certain, during that period of time, no improvement in fuel, fuel, fuel efficiency fell out of the many engine improvements. So the, the, the thing is, fuel economy rarely sells cars. And this is, oh, but performance is, is always one of the reasons you buy a car quickly when you make your decision. It either has to be some, some technology that uh, is improving uh, fuel economy has to be cheaper, and then you might buy it, or regulate it, then you have to buy it if it's level. So there, are, there is a return to a cafe or other similar, uh, it is justified, is justified. Now the second thing is uh, fuel flexibility. The through way system uh, provides for fuel flexibility because it corrects the stoichiometric. Any fuel uh, uh, has a stoichiometric value with air that would could be calibrated would be calibrated uh, uh, with the oxygen sensor, and you would still get hydrocarbon CO and NOx reductions from from any hydrocarbon fuel uh, that it was uh, uh, <coughs> uh, totally flex flex fuel, gasoline to uh, some other type of fuel. What, what would be needed? Well, uh, future engines could be designed to be fuel flexible, flexible while retaining stoichiometric air fuel ratio uh, for various fuels and fuel mixes via the incorporation within the electronic control, control unit of engine fuel, engine maps uh, with calibration for each particular fuel to be either sensed or through uh, actual uh, control metering, uh, uh, actual control sensors uh, for continuous engine fuel or fuel metering. And another thing is that the materials that are wetted by the fuel, gaskets and lines and other wetted surfaces should be corrosion resistant with, with a wide range of fuels. And then there's this potential advantage uh, 
if all, all the fuel, all the en engines in in this country totally become fuel flexible, is enormous. And while I was at it, uh, uh, may maybe we can go back and uh, uh, to existing engines, in use engines, and um, improve their fuel flexibility, and also change calibrations so that uh, fuel efficiency uh, efficiency uh, improvements can be made while maintaining emissions. And this would establish a whole new industry for this purpose. Uh, next uh, opportunity is uh, thermal energy that already exists in the exhausts. And you've heard of, of the, the exhaust being as hot as uh, 800 degrees centigrade and maybe uh, running on the average 600 degrees centigrade. That's plenty of power in that industry and in, in that exhaust to generate uh, electricity instead of having the engine generate electricity. The engine is rather inefficient anyway. And to generate electricity, rely on it to generate electricity is, in, is therefore inefficient. And um, <coughs> so there are a turbo alternators or rather high speed uh, um, uh, turbine type uh, uh, generators that could be, could be placed in and, and generate the 100% or a very high percentage of the electrical power needed by the vehicle. And then the, the engine would only be used to <coughs> drive the drivetrain. And therefore, could, it could be smaller. It would have, being smaller, it would have, it would have uh, <coughs> uh, less uh, friction to overcome. And, uh, and, um, would uh, also uh, require less part load throttle. Part load throttle is, in a, is uh, inefficient. It would be more full load throttle just for the powertrain. And uh, that equals fuel economy. It must also be compatible with a turbocharger or a supercharger and EGR requirements. And there is a reference. Uh, I attended a BMW think tank some years ago and this was my idea, and it won <laughs> the, the, um, the, the competition, among others, uh, um, for uh, providing BMW with uh, the future driving machine. Uh, that might be tapped into for more detail. And finally, I want to say something about uh, metrics. Uh, the metrics of if you try to regulate carbon dioxide, uh, I, I'm not sure how that happens, but uh, each fuel has uh, carbon, carbon dioxide uh, ultimate point um, when, when you're most efficient. Uh, if if uh, too much air is there, the carbon dioxide is come, comes down by dilution. If there's insufficient air, carbon dioxide comes from inefficient burning. So uh, this has always been a problem in burners, you know, gas burners. Uh, you know, where, where are you? Uh, how do you know whether you're on the lean side or the rich side? Uh, that's been dealt with uh, also by power companies, and they, they uh, typically try to get uh, very efficient uh, combustion <coughs> and um, uh, try to maximize the amount of carbon dioxide coming out of uh, hydrocarbon combustion. Uh, now, the example I use uh, about a metric is uh, the current PM mass emission metric uh, that is used for diesel engines. That's insufficient to assure a clean diesel engine. Uh, in order to get a clean diesel engine that hopefully could be used as a most efficient, fuel efficient engine uh, here in California, uh, a particle count limit must be added to particle mass gravimetric limit uh, to assure the elimination of toxic uh, solid insoluble alveoli penetrating nan nanoparticles. That's the most serious becoming uh, more widely agreed the most serious health issue with respect to diesel. And best available control technology is obligatory. 
So PMS measurement by the gravimetric system uh, cannot distinguish uh, particle size fractions. And this has been proven in the European Union PMP study that's been recently completed this year. The report is out. A second reason for uh, bringing this up is that black soot, soot par uh, particles are implicated in global warming. And is there a size fraction impact? I don't know the answer to that, but I think that surface area is going to play an important role here. And these black particles, <coughs> invisible black particles um, that are a nanometer size have a great amount of surface area compared to a large uh, uh, particle. OK, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that uh, and so we can provide some time for uh, questioning. Uh, there are some other slides that uh, uh, are, are uh, available uh, on the web. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions uh, about them, also uh, include them in your questions. Hello. Yeah, I have a question on the N2O. And I've heard that the N2O is maximum when the temperature of the catalyst is between 200 and 600 degrees. And uh, is there any way you can reduce that by changing the catalyst? Or are there any other technique to reduce the N2O? Yeah, uh, N2O from a three-way catalyst. A three-way catalyst doesn't make any N2O that, uh, that I know of. But uh, uh, I, I mentioned one point <coughs> when uh, methyl alcohol was used, you know, methanol, uh, during the cold start, only during the cold start, and a palladium catalyst were used, we, we saw, measured for a couple of seconds, some N2O when using an FTIR instrument. Yeah. The only time I ever saw it was three-way catalyst. So uh, my, in my opinion, uh, <coughs> uh, with the new calibrations, if if methanol were used in the future, new calibrations have uh, the three-way catalyst right on the right, right, right on the manifold. They heat up uh, quicker. There's a whole different kind of uh, engine startup uh, now, so that they heat up the catalyst heat up uh, to operating uh, temperatures uh, in seconds, ten seconds, less than twenty, and. Um, uh, I, I, I expect that we wouldn't even find the N2O there in that, in that condition. Yeah, my second question is, is there any replacement for palladium? Any replacement? I mean, uh, for... Yeah, catalyst, I mean. For a catalyst. Well, um, uh, methanol is, uh, I mean, a, a palladium catalyst is a good three-way. Palladium, rhodium is a good uh, three-way catalyst for uh, the methanol fuel. Uh, yes, there was uh, plenty of others, but uh, in my recollection, that was the best. Yes. Hi. Do you have any recollection of um, what the estimates for the unit cost of the three-way catalyst were coming out of the folks that were not anxious to see it become a standard, and how did those compare with the actual costs um, once you had your factories well, in place? Well, the, the one the one recollection I had in the original uh, venue was uh, statement said the the catalytic converter would cost eight hundred dollars, and uh, at that time. Uh, we, d we did our work. Uh, I remember making a presentation to a, a catalyst company in Japan that had been using pellet of catalyst, and uh, the estimate at that time was $40. Uh, so, um, but they're no longer $40. I mean, right now, uh, you know, catalytic converters, uh, well, let, me, let me say, with low sulfur fuel, uh, that low sulfur gasoline that we currently have, uh, 
there's the opportunity to take a lot of the pressure pressure to metal cost out and still have a very uh, durable and high efficiency catalyst, feedback catalyst. So I believe that cars are um, tending to have a longer lifetime. It's not unusual now for cars to go 150 or even 200,000 miles. How does a uh, freeway catalyst performance, um, how is that after, say, 100, 150, 200,000 miles? Is there any data on that? <coughs> in, in the, yes. In, in the beginning, uh, catalysts were asked to pass uh, 50,000 mile uh, durability test. And that was considered to be the half-life of the car. And uh, then it increased to 100,000 miles. And that was considered, I think, still considered to be the half-life of the car. Now, um, there, there was a voluntary uh, uh, requirement to pass 150,000 miles at a reduced, some, some let's say, High, higher level of uh, allowed emissions. And uh, <clears throat> I believe that this uh, new fuel in the United States is less, less of an impact than California because you always had lower sulfur fuel. But um, with, with the sulfur coming out, one of the impede, uh, uh, well, not a poison, but something that impeded the performance of the catalyst was sulfur. So we're removing sulfur is going to help performance. And I also mentioned <coughs> that um, thermal, uh, hydrothermal uh, resistance have, has improved. And you know, when I say hydrothermal, there's, there's some water in the exhaust of uh, gas, and that, that's an that's a element that centers the uh, <coughs> matrix, uh, this open porous layer that I talked about. And therm thermal high exposure to a very high temperature also uh, causes sintering to occur. And I, I was saying that they've already gone up over 1,100 degrees. And if you exposed it to hydrothermal exposure, only 65% of, no, 45% uh, of the total surface area would be lost. Uh, so that, and they're still, still active. It's incredible. So I believe. Uh, uh, well, it's always been our target within the industry that these catalysts last for the life of the car. Maybe that's coming to pass. Pass. Well, thank you for a very nice uh, presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it seems like the three-way catalyst really was a silver bullet that cleaned up emissions from, from gasoline vehicles. Do you think we'll ever have a single technology that will do the same for diesel? Um, uh, no, uh, I th thank you very much for the compliment. It, it, is, it is amazing to reflect on it and have it called the silver bullet. Uh, I go silver. <laughs> um, but no, I, I don't think so. Uh, we, we have two different kinds of problems. One is the, the particles. Uh, you know, PM it creates this black soot, the diesel engine. The other one is NOx. And uh, to, to uh, I, I think maybe the technology to, to remove both can be put together. And I anticipate that might be done. But the unit operations of filtration are quite a bit different than the uh, chemical uh, uh, reduction of NOx to nitrogen. And uh, they, they, they have to be dealt with separately. It might be that they can be, be put together I really anticipate that that'll happen, um, but we'll have to see to 20, to the year, the model year 2010, as to whether or not my former industry and the auto, uh, the engine manufacturers will uh, bring that forth. Yes, as companies have adopted this technology, do they suddenly just put on every model starting a certain year, or do they phase it in over a period of years? Well, you know, Volvo uh, did it first. They, they started in California, then they put the, the next model year was in the whole of the United States. 
They didn't use it in Europe until unleaded gasoline came there, and then they did. Um, and uh, Mercedes uh, also, the second model year, did in California. Then they used it throughout the whole United States on all the cars. And sometimes it's really difficult to get on everything when you have a very, very big production of many models and uh, a restricted number of engineers to work <laughs> on each. So, uh, and you have to be careful, you know, before applying it, making sure it's on doing its job uh, uh, physically and uh, uh, and uh, use su su sufficient uh, hangers and uh, attachments and mechanical things that wouldn't cause trouble in the, in the field. So you have to be careful. Let me uh, read a question for you, John, that came in through the uh, webcast. Um, John Hart from our sister agency, Toxic Substance Control, the Department of Toxic Sus Substance Control. Uh, he's posing a pretty specific question for you. Uh, how are the cerium oxides applied to the catalyst and at what concentrations for O2 storage? Oh, um. How are they applied? Well, <coughs> um, there, there, there are two techniques that could be utilized, and I think both are. Uh, one is uh, they can be incorporated as uh, originally as uh, cerium uh, powder, uh, or fine, fine powder, into the slurries that go up into making uh, and applying the uh, catalytic layer in wet form, and then calcined when, when the dried and calcined, the cerium is uh, well pos uh, uniformly positioned within the uh, catalytic layer and throughout the, the catalytic unit. Uh, another one is to use uh, 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 cerium salts of some type uh, 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 that would be uh, uh, soluble form and uh, <coughs> put them in and then uh, uh, react them uh, to become uh, cerium oxide in the calcination process. Uh, what I think both are used. I'm not, I'm not certain what, what is used. I'm not revealing what Engelhardt is used. But I think gen generically uh, that answers that question. Um, uh, just try to follow up with the N2O issue. Uh, I did uh, some studies uh, back to a few years ago, and uh, we did see some N2O emissions by using FTR instruments. And what are you uh, saying? Uh, FTR, FTIR. Oh. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, um, they, they mainly can be found during the STAR events. And uh, based on the literature review, and we realized since um, different heavy metal has different tem uh, temperature range favored to generate the N2O. Uh, but when the temperature reached to the uh, light up temperature, then the N2O just go away. So this happened to not only old vehicles, but also some new technique vehicles. But uh, based on the techniques, when the cold star time frame much uh, small, quick and shorter, the N2O peak will be really small and shrink. But uh, definitely you will see some of them. So, I, uh, so and you're amplifying my uh, uh, explanation earlier, and I think you're, you're exactly right. I would like to ask you, though, uh, the, the, the catalyst that you looked at, did they contain palladium? Uh, yes. In other words, there, were, there was yeah, a... Yeah, actually they have, we saw uh, three, most of them have three uh, heavy metals, but unfortunately back to a few years ago, we have no idea the details, what percentage, because those are top secret for the catalyst agency, yeah. the ca uh, catalyst manufacturers. Because Engel Engelhardt had a, uh, you know, palladium plus that was uh, very unique. So it didn't have any rhodium in it, but it was, it was getting uh, freeway catalyst function. So it was an excellent catalyst. So I really wondered whether you had tested that one. I don't know the answer to that, but, but I never tested it.
One of the uh, issues that we're dealing with in meeting the upcoming PM 2.5 standards, which um, we have until 2014 essentially to meet those, is what we call the legacy fleet, the uh, existing fleet of diesel trucks that are designed to last for uh, 20, 30, 40 years um, when we can no longer afford to have uh, vehicles that are that dirty in the concentrations that we have them in the south coast of San Joaquin Valley. Um, you, you sort of, you touched on um, the issue of making uh, vehicles more responsive to these changing needs in your, your fuel flexibility point. Are there other things, other ways in which we can anticipate um, the need for cars to be much cleaner um, sooner than they are designed to be. I mean, they're designed to have a long lifetime and we may find uh, at some point in the future that we can't afford to have ca cars that are 10 years old um, meeting 10-year-old standards. They have to be updated more quickly than that. Yeah, I, um, <coughs> I, uh, are, are you referring to diesel engines uh, as being the legacy fleet or you mean spark ignited gasoline engines? See, see uh, old spark ignited engines uh, do have available to them a replacement uh, system uh, if, if they're not meeting, if they don't meet the uh, state's uh, emi uh, emission tests um, <coughs> and the catalytic converters. Now, there, there is a product that can replace that catalytic converter. And uh, uh, <coughs> California has uh, revised the uh, uh, regulation about how they uh, perform, and they're now uh, uh, more closely aligned with average uh, original emission control uh, catalyst than they were in the past. They only had a pass in the past. They only had a pass 25,000 miles of durability, but now it's much more strict, and that's available for uh, removing the old, the failed uh, catalytic converter that's failed for any reason and replacing with a new one. Uh, and, it should, and it should work better also because of the lower sulfur fuel. For diesel engines, uh, I, uh, and there's m most of the engines out there are in the construction industry or uh, in the uh, heavy-duty uh, road vehicles. There's many old vehicles, and they do last 40 years. And uh, there is uh, retrofit te technology for taking those engines for, that weren't originally designed for diesel emission control and retrofitting them with diesel emission control. And that, uh, of course, is happening here in, in, in California. And I believe every engine can get retrofit. And if it can't, it probably should be rebuilt. And if it can't be rebuilt, it probably should be replaced with a newer engine and retired. And put out of business, not, not given to some third world country, but uh, actually end its life here when it's uh, removed from service. John, I have another question from the webcast, and I think we're going to take um, this one, the last one from the webcast, and then I think we have one more from the audience here. Uh, this is coming from Kyle from uh, Westport in uh, British Columbia. As far as stoichiometric combustion under natural gas spark ignition conditions, are there any future leading technologies that would allow for the reduction of precious metal surface concentrations? Okay, can I have that uh, just again, please? As far as stoichiometric combustion, for natural ga gas spark ignition conditions, are there any future leading technologies that would allow for the reduction of precious metal surface concentrations? Um, <clears throat> I, uh, for first of all, natural gas, uh, natural gas uh, is uh, uh, applied to engines. 
It can, it, it also can be applied to diesel engines, converted to natural gas. And uh, <coughs> uh, usually uh, they, that conversion added to a, a spark ignited system. Um, and uh, the uh, catalyst that would be used for if, if it were controlled a three-way catalyst, but usually not, they're usually activation catalysts. But if it were controlled a three-way catalyst, I believe a palladium rhodium catalyst would work best. Now, what, what, um, uh, what you don't find them, actually. The only place I know of them where they are stoichiometric are uh, in Switzerland. There are two manufacturers in Switzerland, Liebherr, I think, is one, who, who have taken the natural gas combustion uh, and really changed so that natural gas combustion uh, spark ignited um, gives a thermal efficiency equal to the diesel engine. Uh, it has the lowest emissions of any engine I think I ever saw. It's very high uh, uh, compression, uh, compression ratio, something like 23 bar. It uses 50% levels of EGR and um, and uh, is, is a stoichiometric, is a stoichiometric, and uh, what I believe is a palladium rhodium catalyst, a three-way catalyst. Now, that's a recollection. I have to go back and take a look at everything, but uh, I, I think uh, if you go to that company, leave here and ask, and there's one other uh, Swiss company, ask. They've been applying them to uh, stationary engines. Uh, I, I would love to see one be installed here in uh, the United States. I, I gave a talk to, to India because they were uh, also interested in almost the same thing, but it's several years ago. And I also can prob provide that, uh, uh, Roberto, Alberto, uh, that uh, presentation from my archives and I'll give it to you. Hi again. Uh, it sounds as though you, you think that um, uh, market-based uh, emission allowance trading system might have a uh, negative effect on technological innovation. Um, can you expand on that and say well, whether or not there are any economic well, disadvantages? Well, one, one, the thing I question first is that it's market-based. I, th I think it's a, you know, that it's, uh, here, here I have a plate, and it, I'm, I'm saying I'm eating apple pie, but I don't have it. It's not apple pie. So uh, I think uh, that that average in banking and trading is was instituted during the former President Bush's administration by the name I can't remember. I know it's his, his name is Borden, somebody, uh, as a means to drag things out and hold them back. And it's not market-based at all. It's uh, mar real market-based comes, comes from not average banking and trading. Uh, and uh, um, when, and I believe real market-based comes from somebody who has an idea, uh, thinks there is a market for it, wants to have money to uh, develop it, has to put in a business plan, has to show that this amount of, this amount of effort will provide that market need. And uh, if it's developed, uh, there will be a business. This thing is something different. I don't know what to call it, but I don't think it's market-based. But it's called market-based. I, do, do I think a strong standard? Right. In, rather than a – so you think we need a clear, a clear, strong standard as a signal to stimulate investment in new technology rather than – Yeah. We're, we're talking about emissions control. You're talking about fuel economy. And uh, uh, something – uh, a market will pick something up on a automobile if it provides a benefit, and it's cheap. That that'll that'll happen, uh, and there's payback to it. 
But uh, when, when, the, when it's extra, an extra cost for a benefit in uh, air pollution, or even health uh, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, that doesn't sell cars. Um, the only way to get around that is to regulate it. And you should have a proper uh, uh, regulation with a proper uh, metric for measuring um, the uh, uh, whatever you want to control. <coughs> well, those people who develop something to meet that standard already start out with a business plan. That's and they have to look at the market they're uh, that's market based serving the market they're serving. One of the cheaper alternatives for reducing NOx emissions from the uh, diesel legacy fleet here in California by the timelines imposed on us by EPA to attain the PM 2.5 standard and significantly reduce uh, ozone rapidly is the retrofitting um, of these engines uh, with select catalytic reduction systems. What is the potential within the next decade to develop a catalytic system that doesn't require the augmentation of uh, a reagent like ammonia or urea uh, to reduce NOx in, in these, from these systems? Um, you're, you're correct, uh, SCR, selected catalyst reduction with ammonia, whether it comes from urea or otherwise, uh, is the leading candidate uh, uh, for uh, old and new engines. Uh, we may see that in uh, 2010 to meet the national standard. And it can be retrofitted to the legacy fleet as well. It's very expensive. Uh, it, you know, it is a panacea. It doesn't cover every uh, engine. And those that are operating in urban areas uh, at low speed uh, May, may have to use EGR instead of SCR because there's a low temperature limitation to selective catalyst reduction with ammonia. Uh, now, but you asked, uh, what else <laughs> is there on the horizon? And um, the, I, I mentioned this uh, earlier, not, not in earlier discussions today, but uh, there is something at Ford but it's still using ammonia. The Ford Motor Company has been looking at it. It's called a, <coughs> a uh, still uses ammonia. It's ammonia storage and release under layer catalyst. Uh, or, uh, and um, I don't know enough about it right here now to explain it. So there is something. And uh, if there's any ideas and that's coming, uh, you know, it'll be the, the there will be a business plan put up, and they'll look at the amount of money they have to spend and uh, what the market is, and uh, um, it will be developed. Because nothing is without, you know, some negatives. And SER is expensive. It doesn't work for every engine. No, it doesn't work, work for every engine application. Sorry, it works for every engine. Okay, I think uh, this is going to do it for us. John, again, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to coming out from J New Jersey to see us. Thank you. Ex excellent presentation, an excellent story. Um, I think uh, you saw that we have quite a bit of interest also in the diesel engine, and the points that you made are points well taken, perhaps better left for a future uh, chairman seminar that we can bring you back and focus on diesel control. But for now, we want to thank you again and uh, uh, appreciate all of those of you participating here and also on the webcast. Thank you. Thank you also for inviting me.